He is our King, and He's worthy of praise. Praise God. I'm so thankful for Him. Amen. Amen. We're continuing tonight in our study of uh, church history, going into the Protestant Reformation and leading up to the Enlightenment, all the way up to the Second Great Awakening. And if I can finish it all tonight, we'll go all the way up to 1899. From 1517 to 1899. Uh, and if that doesn't hurt your brains, maybe you'll come back next week. <laughs> but uh, let's go in our Bibles to Romans 117. Praise God. Romans 117. We ended last week talking about those pre Protestant Protestants or proto Protestants, people that stood out between the 1100s and the 1500s um, as taking a stand against the Roman Catholic Church and its corruption and its doctrine by being restorationists, their desire, uh, the Albigensians, the Waldensians, uh, and other groups that had a strong desire to go back to the scripture and to restore the apostolic church. Those were their, in many cases, their own words, to restore an apostolic faith. In most cases, they were completely wiped out. In some cases, other groups that were less focused on Rome would protect them. Uh, and so many people were baptized in Jesus' name in small places. Some did receive the Holy Ghost. There are There is evidence of that. And so we're leading up to uh, the time of Martin Luther. Romans 1.17 says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written... The just shall live by faith. And we know that living for God is about walking from one faithful experience to another experience. But there's another scripture that says we live for him from glory to glory. And so there are faithful experiences and there are glorious experiences. There are Most of our life is just made up of from faith to faith. But then sometimes God does miraculous and glorious things like filling us with the Holy Ghost. And so there are those times in our lives of glory. But the point of this passage is to say that we are justified by faith. We are made just by faith through Jesus Christ, through the work of Calvary. The work of Calvary is completed. And when we confess Him with our mouths, repent of our sins, are baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of sins, and are baptized with the Holy Ghost, those ways are how the Lord applies the work of Calvary to our lives. And so many people looked at this passage of Scripture and they began to say, that's not what we're hearing taught at the church on Sunday. In fact, we don't even know what we're being taught because it's in Latin, and nobody speaks Latin but the priest. So as we're beginning to see people under threat of death, and in many cases they were killed for translating the Bible in the common tongue, people began to see Romans 117 and began to say something is wrong with what we're being taught. I'm so thankful to know that the just live by faith tonight. Amen. Brother Andrew, would you please pray over this Lord. lesson? Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your word again tonight, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for anointing upon our pastor to bring it to us, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that <clears throat> you're good, Lord, and that you've been good through the ages. And thank you for this lesson. We pray that you bless uh, Brother Hush as he delivers your word and bless our ears to receive it tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. We know... We talked last week about John Wycliffe <laughs> translating the Bible, Tyndale translating the Bible, and John Huss preaching the gospel as he understood it in Scotland out of him and his uh, execution came the Presbyterian movement. His followers eventually began to call themselves Presbyterian in Scotland. Um, I mentioned the Albigensians, I mentioned the Waldensians, other people who came along and heroically Stood up during the stood up to the Catholic Inquisition. During the Inquisitions, there were many Inquisitions. It basically means uh, gatherings of cardinals and bishops to look into specific groups of people um, and to make sure that they were uh, eliminated if they were following heresies. Um, the worst Inquisitions were, of course, the Spanish Inquisitions, and the reason that they were worse is because the Spanish uh, crown had been subjected uh, and exiled for about 700 years off and on. And the Spanish, the Iberian Peninsula, which we know today as Spain and Portugal, had been part of the 
Muslim caliphate for close to 700 years. And so they wanted to make sure that they took over Spain culturally. And so the Spanish Inquisition went after anybody that was not Roman Catholic. Under the Muslim caliphate, uh, the Muslims used Jewish citizens as managerial class. And the Muslims would reign and live in splendor. Um, and the Jewish people would uh, manage those people who were of European descent and not of Jewish descent. So under the Spanish Inquisition, there developed a strong anti-Muslim uh, basically a cleansing of the land, an ethnic cleansing of the land to get rid of all traces of Islam. Uh, and that took a few hundred years, but by the time of the 1500s, they had moved it down. What, what was left of Islam left the Iberian Peninsula through that land that is called Andalusia, which is the, the tip of Spain along Africa. Um, and so they went after Muslims, they went after Jews, and they went after anybody that would have we would consider Pentecostal or apostolic that was not strict Catholics. The if you've ever seen if you've ever seen anybody um, air dry a Virginia ham, or uh, you ever had anybody ever had country ham that's air dried ham and not necessarily smoked ham. Sometimes it's smoked, but that custom came about uh, and became. It wasn't just that it came about, but that custom developed during the Spanish Inquisition when it became popular to now eat pork. Why wouldn't you be able to eat pork before? Obviously, if you've got, you're part of the Muslim Caliphate, they're not gonna allow pork to be eaten in your land. And so hanging a ham outside of your window or outside of your door and letting it dry was a great way to let everybody know, I'm a Christian, I'm not Jewish, and I'm not Muslim. And so the Inquisition was going about looking for people and one of the literal signs that it was a Christian household was We've got a pig's leg hanging outside of our door. Isn't that great? So there's, to this day, you can eat some of the most delicious jamón ibérico, which means Spanish ham or Iberian ham. Uh, and that came from that, that season of time. The Spanish Inquisition was horrible. I won't go into details about the way people were treated in torture, but one of the ways people were treated that would not recant um, was that they were marched into the Atlantic Ocean uh, and they were made to keep marching until they either, sometimes they were tied together, sometimes they were not tied together, but they would have to drown rather than give up their faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, Muslims were also treated this way and Jews were as well, but mostly it was people that did not follow the traditions of the Roman Catholic Church at the time. So in 1517, somebody uh, came along that opened the door for the Reformation. Justification by faith is the key of that revelation that began to open that door in 17. In 1483, a man named Martin Luther was born in Eiselbahn, Germany, to a peasant family. He enrolled at the University of Erfurt in 1505, and in 1510, he took a pilgrimage to Rome that changed his life, because all he saw in Rome, where he thought he was going to learn, was the excesses of the Vatican. He saw the excesses of corruption and politics of the church and saw basically just an all-around party and political atmosphere. Not too long after that, about seven years after that, on October 31st at his church in Wittenberg, he posted a piece of parchment and he called it his 95 Theses in which he opposed the sale of indulgences. Remember I told you that a penury indulgence was what was granted by the Roman Catholic Church to anybody that would go on a crusade. Well, it worked to get people to go on the crusades, but the crusades failed miserably. There weren't that many, and they were eventually defeated by the Muslim, by the, by the caliphate, by the Muslim Empire. Uh, but the Catholic Church, by the time uh, Martin Luther, a priest, uh, came around, people were able to buy indulgences. And so if you wanted to have a really good party weekend, you could pay the priest and say, I need a six month indulgence because I plan on being drunk for the next six months and I don't know who I'm gonna uh, hurt and I don't know who I'm gonna sleep with and I don't know what kind of parties they're gonna be at and I don't, I don't even remember my name, but I really wanna go to heaven. So Martin Luther opposed that and he began the Reformation on October 31st, 1517, even though he didn't know he was doing that. 
Rather than inspiring debate, it just made the church angry. And a papal bull was issued three years later in 1520. That is, in those days, the Pope had the power of uh, his authority was absolute. And so he issued a papal bull threatening excommunication if Luther did not recant his position in 60 days. Well, over those three years, people had begun to read the 95 Theses, and they had begun to say, especially in Germany, he's got a point. We are justified by faith. I'm not going to read the 95 Theses today, but the, the basis of them was that salvation is by faith and not by money and not by works. December 10th, 1520, Luther built a fire and burned the papal bull. That's a great way to make the Pope mad. A papal bull is not a bull. It's a letter that has the full force of the Pope behind it, and it became known as a bull because it was not retractable. At the Diet of Worms, that sounds gross. At the Diet of Worms in 1521, they sat around and ate worms. No, it's just a gathering of people. Uh, and they didn't eat worms. It's a city. But at the Diet of Worms, they pronounced he was a heretic. That's not good. So then he had a, a, stance, a stance of the church against his life. His entire life, uh, he would be threatened with capital punishment. But he refused to back down unless someone could prove that he was wrong by scripture. Does that sound familiar? So he lived under the sentence of death, but he was supported by the German people. German princes supported him, and Germany became the foundation for what we know as the Protestant Reformation. He died a natural death in 1546. The term Protestant was born out of the Diet of Worms, or there was a meeting of princes. I love saying that. The Diet of Worms. It's, it's, so, it's so great. Just think of spaghetti, and then sleep well tonight. So there was a Diet of Spear in 1529 where princes met and began to use the term Protestant. And so the people that protested the predominant and overwhelming influence of the Catholic Church were called Protestants or Protestants. The major divisions of Protestantism were Lutheranism, of course, by Martin Luther. Ulrich Zwingli began to come about at the same time as Martin Luther in Switzerland, and he developed a division of Protestantism called the Reformed Church, which still exists in many forms today, as well as the Martin Luther uh, Martin Luther's uh, denomination called Lutheranism or Lutheran. Uh, the other development of Protestantism, division of Protestantism, was Anabaptist. Um, John Calvin was also part of the Reformed Church. Zwingli and Calvin went way further than Luther did. Luther did not intend to create a new denomination. He was forced to create a new denomination by the Catholic Church, excommunicating him. The Reformed Church intended to create a new denomination under Ulrich Zwingli and John Calvin out of the base of Geneva. Um, and so they wanted to expand on this idea of salvation by grace through faith. Of course, John Calvin developed the idea of predestination and his five-fingered Calvinism, T-U-L-I-P which each one stands for uh, a type of teaching of Calvinism. The Anabaptists were followers of Zwingli in 1525, but they renounced infant baptism, and they desired a full restoration of the Bible church. They wanted an apostolic re restoration. They wanted to go all the way back, specifically before Constantine. Remember I told you two weeks ago that everything began to go south under Constantine. And right at the time of his death was the beginning of the great falling away uh, of the church. They resisted the notion of a state church. Protestants agreed with the state church. In fact, to this day, three, there's a 3% tax that pays for the Lutheran church in Germany. And wouldn't that be nice if we could run things with tax money? No, it would not be nice. I would not, I would not participate. Um, but uh, he re they resisted the idea of being connected to the state because of its obvious corruption problems. Then there was the Anglican Church, which was not established because of a desire for scripture. It was established, established because of a desire for a dude to get a divorce. The Anglican Church, the Church of England in the United States called the Episcopal Church, was established by King Henry VIII in 1534. Anybody remember that song? Yeah. <laughs> I am, I am, I won't sing it for you, I'm Henry VIII, I am. Uh, anyway, uh, old Henry wanted to 
divorce Catherine of Aragon and marry Anne Boleyn. And so he decided to work his way. It took him years to do it, but finally in 1534 he got the arch archbishops behind him in England and he was able to divorce his first wife even though the Roman Church wouldn't allow him to. Uh, he put her away. She lived a natural life, um, but uh, she had to live in a palace away from him so he could cavort with his many wives, uh, eventually having Anne Boleyn beheaded uh, and moving on to another one. That was the foundation of the, the Anglican Church, so four main branches of Protestantism. Uh, Lutheranism teaches justification by faith, teaches the sole authority of Scripture, means not the sole authority of Rome. They rejected the Pope's authority. They believed in the priesthood of all believers. And they, they reduced all of the sacraments down from praying to saints, etc., etc., to just baptism and communion. The Reformed Church um, believed that baptism and the Eucharist, which is communion, were symbolic. And they believed in predestination. Uh, of course, John Calvin took Augustinian teaching, which also taught predestination, uh, and he expanded greatly upon it and eventually ended up persecuting oneness believers and overseeing the burning at the stake of Michael Servetus, who was a oneness believer who baptized in Jesus' name. He was also a pulmonologist. Um, they believe, the Reformed Church believed that the gospel is the culmination of the law. According, of course, the scripture teaches this, that the, the finishing, the completion of the law was Jesus Christ. Um, the Anglican Church was established just pretty much for King Henry VIII, but it developed as a state church in the United Kingdom. They have two sacraments, the Lord's Supper and baptism, and they rejected the Pope's authority and they rejected Rome's authority and believed in justification by faith alone. But the Anabaptists, remember, they had no state ties. And so they believed in justification by faith. They believed the Bible was it, 100%, no Rome. They believed in the priesthood of all believers. They believed in the separation of church and state. They believed in the importance of personal faith. This is huge. If you have the priesthood of all believers, it necessarily means that you believe that all believers can talk to God for themselves. They believed that the Eucharist was simply a symbol. That they didn't believe in transubstantiation, which the Catholic Church teaches. They didn't believe in consubstantiation, which the Lutheran Church teaches. They believed that the wafer and the wine are simply symbolic, which is what the scripture teaches. They believed in genuine repentance and conversion, a real experience with the Lord. They rejected unconditional eternal security, and they rejected unconditional election, which are hallmarks of Calvinism. They had foot washing, foot washing, the dirty underbelly of Pentecostalism. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, they baptized by immersion. They started out by pouring. And quickly they begin to look and see that the word means baptizo in Greek, which means to dip or immerse. They were called Anabaptists, not because they didn't believe in baptism, but because they rejected infant baptism. They were anti-baptism, and they didn't call themselves that. They were only anti-baptism in the sense of they didn't baptize babies. Um, they believed in demonstrative worship, and there are many instances of them baptizing in Jesus' name. In many cases, they embraced all apostolic truth, especially in the beginning. They were heavily persecuted. I told you last week about how some cities were decorated with their heads on spikes. They believed in practical holiness, living for God a holy life, not just uh, the church being holy or being holy because it's called the church, but living holy. Uh, Brother James, would you read Hebrews 6, 1 and 2? Therefore, leaving the, the principle of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not leaving again, not, not late, late again the, the foundation of, of repentance, of dead work, and of faith toward God. Uh, of the doctrine and of baptism and laying on of hand, and of resurrection of, of, the, of the dead, and of the eternal judgment. Amen. Amen. Moving on. Truth is progressive. That's what that passage says. Truth is progressive. When you want to know the Lord, the Lord will show you what you can receive, and then he'll show you more that you can receive, and more than you can receive. Just like you don't give a steak to an infant, you break them in slowly, right? It's exactly the same. 
And so truth is progressive. You want the Lord, the Spirit of God will lead you into all truth. And so progressive revelation is a real thing. But it doesn't mean that God didn't try to tell Martin Luther everything. It just means that Martin Luther said, this is as far as I will go. And then Ulrich Zwingli went further. But the Anabaptists said, we want it all. And some of the Anabaptists said, no, we don't want it all. And so they began to develop into sects. And then they were heavily persecuted. So they had to develop into different sects and groups. Once the door was opened to challenge the current orthodoxy, theological change began to happen rapidly. The dominoes began to fall and the snowball effect began to happen. Some people desired a more biblical truth and others simply followed men. In England, the Refor Reformation re reflected continental Europe. They had Anglicans. Out of the Anglican church developed Puritans, which was their desire was to purify the Church of England. They strongly believed in church and state together. In fact, Oliver Cromwell was the Lord Protector of England and started a civil war um, and was the Lord Protector, I believe, of England for 10 years. They also had Baptists and Quakers, whereas the Lutherans, Calvinists, and Reformed, and Anabaptists were in Europe. England had the Anglicans, the Puritans, Baptists, and Quakers. I said earlier, John Huss, I meant to say John Knox, gave birth to the Presbyterian Church in Scotland. Uh, and the Presbyterian Church began to develop uh, and they adopted Protestant and reject Protestantism and rejected the Catholic Mass in 1560. So you can see 1517, the 95 Theses, by 1560, you don't even have Catholicism except in, in a minority in the United Kingdom. And in Scotland, they reject it altogether. The Puritans believed that the Reformation was not going far enough. Don't confuse the Puritans from the Pilgrims. Not the same group, but they ran in the same circles. Circles in which people wore black and white and big buckles, apparently. They regarded the Roman Catholic Church as apostate. They believed, the Puritans believed the Roman Catholic Church was apostate, fully filled with heresy and teaching only corruption. They wanted to divest the church from all Roman Catholic elements. They embraced a strict Calvinism. Remember, Puritans, more than anybody else, are the foundation of the United States of America. We would not have had a revolution if we would have been depending on the South. The South didn't even want to get involved. It was the North and Tidewater, which is the central states, not the Deep South. And, and the North and Tidewater were overrun with Baptist, Quakers, and Puritans. So we're, we're leading up to the First Great Awakening and the Second Great Awakening in the United States. But in England, before the Puritans had come to what would eventually become the United States, what was the, the uh, colonies at that time, they favored a Presbyterian form of church government, which is different from a congregational form of church government. We're basically hybrid. We, we have a church board, which is a church presbytery, but we make decisions on the church constitution with the vote of everyone. And the church board has the right to pass certain uh, rules, etc. Uh, but there is not an absolute authority of the pastor of the church. The pastor of the church is accountable to the church and to the church board. So there's a difference in Presbyterian and congregational church government. The Puritans believed in person, personal morality through legislation. They wanted to enforce uh, morality by creating communities that were pure and perfect. Uh, of course, we know this only lasts one generation, and it doesn't even last very long in that generation. It will eventually fail. Most of the communities in eastern Minnesota were established by Puritans. Did you know that? Did you know that the Alexandria area is the farthest line of eastern Puritan culture in the United States? So, so Minnesota's culture was most, the western part of Minnesota was more of a western culture, but the majority of the state was established by Puritan peoples. In fact, Cambridge was established by English people who eventually decided it was too cold for them and they were replaced by people who could handle the cold. <laughs> it's true. It is true. That's why it's called Cambridge. Uh, the, the Scandinavians came here and had no idea where Cambridge was in the first place. But they're like, this is a nice place. We'll stay here. We'll grow potatoes. The English couldn't handle it, so we'll stay. But Puritan does not just mean English. It means people that believed in the Puritan ideal. Puritans would move from the east, and they would come to Ohio, which used to be part of Ohio 
used to be called the western part of uh, Delaware. They came to Indiana, and, and they would set up utopian communities in which they would leave one community where they had gotten too, too many people, and they would move to another community. They did that when they came to the United States. The Puritans went to King James with a petition asking for changes in the Anglican Church, and the only one he listened to was to give them an English Bible in 1611. Then there were the Separatists and the Congregationalists. The Separatists uh, were that group of people that settled in Plymouth, Massachusetts in 1620. They wanted to separate from the United Kingdom, from the, uh, the church, and from the government in, the, in, in England. Then there were the Baptists around 1608 or 1609. A man named John Smythe baptized himself and about 40 other adults and began the Baptist movement. They were separatists who began to take another look at the doctrine of baptism. They, the first English Baptist confession of faith was published by Thomas Helvis in 1611. They believed that the church is a community of all believers. That one only joins the church by personal choice. You can't be born into the church, except by the new birth, of course. That you can only, only accept those into the church who showed evidence of a changed life or regeneration. They believed that water baptism was a public confession of faith and that it was a means of visibly joining the church and they rejected infant baptism. Don't confuse the Anabaptists and the Baptists. They insisted on immersion as scriptural, but they did not believe baptism was necessary for salvation. They believed all doctrine and practices, the Baptists believed all doctrine and practices are supposed to come from the Bible. They had a congregational form of government. Everybody got to participate. They believed in separation of church and state, and they predominantly believed in unconditional eternal security. Once you're saved, it doesn't matter what you do, you will stay saved, even if you sin. They were mostly Trinitarian, but many of their early writings rejected the Trinity. Baptists, like the Puritans before them, began to settle in the New World, and so the Puritans didn't like this. The Puritans, remember, they wanted everybody to be Puritan, and they wanted the government to fix that problem, and so that is the way it was for 80 to 100 years. Uh, so eventually the Puritans had problems with people amongst them that had different faiths, especially different denominations. And so a man named Roger Williams realized that Puritans weren't going to get along well uh, outside of Pennsylvania, where the Quakers pretty much accepted everybody, but in most of New England, Massachusetts Bay Colony, etc., um, Puritans didn't like the Baptists hanging out amongst them. So he decided to buy a plot of land from the Crown and found a colony called Rhode Island in which everyone could have freedom of conscience. So it was founded as a Baptist colony. The Quakers were instituted in 1652 as English Protestants. They were called the Society of Friends, established by George Fox. Of course, you know the Quaker dude, William Penn. That's whose picture everybody's trying to... I don't know, everybody's forgotten that that's William Penn on the Quaker Oats box, but that's who that is. He was actually a oneness believer. Um, Quakers regularly experienced moves of the Holy Ghost. That's why they were called Quakers. Early Quakers had strong belief in the restoration of Scripture. They wrote many tracts. William Penn wrote a tract against the Trinity for baptism in Jesus' name and for the oneness of God. He held that belief his entire life. He never actually visited Pennsylvania, uh, but William Penn owned Pennsylvania. He had the largest land grant of any single person, and he was granted that because the king had a debt, really sort of a moral debt, to his father, and so he said, I'm going to give your son something that is filled with woods, and so they named it Pennsylvania, which means Penn's Woods. The Quakers believed in a personal experience with God for each individual. They believed in inward guidance and direction from the Lord. Isn't that awesome? They believed in personal holiness. This was early Quakers. They eventually developed into a, a very strange group of people that simply wanted to stand against everything that was the norm. But early Quakers, for the first couple hundred years especially, believed in a life of personal holiness. They believed in equality of everyone. That's why... Uh, by the time the American Revolution formed, slavery had mostly left uh, Quaker Pennsylvania, and it eventually was outlawed. I believe it was outlawed in Pennsylvania even before the American Revolution. They believed that uh, the water baptism and the Lord's Supper were spiritual and 
not literal. They believed in helping those that were less fortunate, and they believed in the oneness of God in most of their early writings. So uh, many people received the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues in the early days of the Quakers. Obviously, if you're allowing the Holy Ghost to move in your church, people are going to receive the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. And so they didn't throw up their hands and say, stop. They threw up their hands and say, please go, Jesus. Let him have his way. Um, we can see that the Lord was revealing truths to these movements that strongly desired a restoration of apostolic truth from the Word of God. Universally, in those that built their denominations on a desire to restore the book of Acts, God would fill them with the Holy Ghost in their early days. Many of them would reject the Trinity, and many of them would baptize by immersion, which was a big deal, and do things differently than the Roman Catholic Church, including rejecting the triune formula. In fact, the Roman Catholic Church has an established council that I think is about 1,200 years old that says, as long as people baptize in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Ghost from Rome, we consider them Catholic. And so these people didn't want to be connected with the corruption of Rome, and so they rejected the Roman forms of baptism, especially uh, of babies. Then came the Methodists. The Bible says, the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. I think I've got one more scripture I want to be read. Sister Lynn, would you read John 16, 13? So that's what happens when you listen to Jesus. When you receive the Holy Ghost, it's going to lead you and guide you. So there came a season of spiritual renewal between the late 1600s and early 1700s. We began to go into a period called the Enlightenment. A man by the name, uh, I'll skip the Pietists because they were uh, right alongside with the Methodists. I'm going to go straight to the Methodists, but there was a group called the Pietists. Um, then there was the Church of the Brethren, which were called the Dunkers because they baptized by immersion. Then there was John Wesley. Uh, parallel with the changes happening from the, the Dunkers and the Pietists was uh, John Wesley, born in 1703, went to Oxford University, and there he founded a club called the Holy Club. And that gave rise to the Methodist denomination. They employed systematic methods which means they did the same thing over and over again, kind of like what we do. We have systems that we run the church by. Um, doesn't mean we don't believe in spiritual things, but we have an order to the way we do things. They employed systemic, systematic methods that earned them the name Methodists. So they had methods. His brother was in the club and also George Whitefield, which you will hear about later as being part of the Great Awakening in the, United, in, in the American colonies. In 1735, the Wesley brothers sailed to Georgia Georgia was not initially part, culturally, Georgia was not initially part of the Deep South. The Deep South was South Carolina and uh, the other areas around it. But Georgia was founded as a utopian society. In fact, in early Georgia, slavery was not accepted. It was more of an industrial society and eventually developed into a slave culture uh, after the founding of the United States. Uh, but Georgia was a place where all kinds of new, exciting ideas were happening. So they went to Georgia. Uh, during their trip, they were strongly influenced by the Moravians, which is another group that I had to skip over. Very interesting group to study. But they differed with the Moravians in feeling that Christians should interact vigorously for, from society, and the Moravians believed in communes. And so if you go to Lancaster County in Pennsylvania, you'll see the difference between Amish barns and Moravian barns is the Moravians believe in art, colors, uh, they're responsible for a lot of quilt designs that we use. A lot of those quilt designs that are on barns in Chisago County came from Arabians. So they believe in expressing themselves through poetry, song, and art, whereas the Amish believe in a plain life. Plain colored barns are not colored barns at all. So the Arabians believe in separating themselves from society. We know that the scripture teaches the, the apostles did not separate themselves from society. They vigorously engaged with society. So the Wesley, Wesleyan brothers were correct according to the scripture. Rather than separating ourselves from society, we're supposed to live in society, but not be of society. 
we're supposed to evangelize society by engaging it. So the Wesleyan brothers rejected predestination, which was huge. They preached the doctrine of sanctification, which was brand new. They believed that coming to know Christ starts a process which lasts your whole life and that we are first sanctified and continually sanctified. And they called it holiness. They believed that a Christian could live above sin. This was also a new change. They taught that the Spirit of God testifies to us, which the Bible says, He bears witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God. And so the Spirit of God tells us we are saved. We will know if we are saved. We can know if we are saved. And they believed that tongue talking was allowed because it was very evident in early Methodism. The Methodist Church became a separate denomination when the Church of England basically said, we don't want nothing to do with your teachings. So it developed through the 1800s into what we call the holiness movement. Um, the Bible tells us that the Spirit gives us enlightenment. It tells us, I has not seen nor hear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him, but he has revealed them unto us by his Spirit. So as the age of enlightenment began to happen in the 1700s, God began to enlighten people, especially those that were being baptized with the Holy Ghost, speaking with tongues, and all kinds of new things began to happen. At about that time, the age of reason that birthed the United States, Thomas Paine, uh, John Locke, uh, their teachings began to teach that we can actually know truth for ourselves. We don't have to depend on the church. We don't have to depend on the government. Uh, and out of the age of reason developed liberal theology. I wanted to tell you those two things because two things were happening in the late 1700s and in the 1800s. Liberal theology was growing, which basically rejects the word of God as final authority. And liberal theology is the foundation for most Christian religions today. And even though a lot of them don't know it, most of them in their, most denominations in their, their teachings reject the Bible as its final authority. And out of the age of enlightenment and the age of reason also came people beginning to say, I want more of God. I don't have to have just, a, I don't have to know God only through a preacher or a priest or through my family's experience with the church or through my pedigree. I want to know him. Um, also, the liberal theological movement taught the social gospel, which is God's kingdom. Just forget about heaven. Forget about hell. Don't worry about that stuff. But God's kingdom is here. Out of the social gospel, the, the mixing of, don't get offended, but the truth is the mixing of politics and religion eventually became what we know as uh, the Republican and Democrat Party. <coughs> Both of them developed as with by very religious people. The two groups developed for different reasons, but people believed that being involved in government was a calling from God. Now, I know some people believe that, and there's a lot of people that, that go to St. Paul and they go to Washington, D.C. feeling like they have a calling and God bless them. But the Bible does not teach us the social gospel. It teaches us the gospel is that Jesus saves us from sins. It doesn't teach that God is, is joined to any one government or nation. God's not an American. Uh, he's not a Romanian. He's not a Russian. He's above all of that. So the social gospel developed and different groups developed. Uh, also movements that were significant in the 19th century, the Seventh-day Adventists, uh, founded by William Miller, and who was a Baptist preacher. Uh, Mormonism, of course, developed around 1830 by Joseph Smith and Brigham Young. The Jehovah's Witnesses, founded by Charles Taze Russell uh, in the late 1850s. Um, and Christian Science was founded by Mary Baker Eddy. Also in the 1800s, missions began. Missions was a brand new kind of thing. Um, the idea of sending people out around the world and around the United States and around Europe. In the late 1800s, something began to happen called the Second Great Awakening. And in the revivals of repentance in the seventh great, Second Great Awakening, which lasted all the way really, if you, depending on who you ask and who you study, all the way into really the 1870s, the Second Great Awakening birthed the abolitionist movement. Here are some things that happened in their revivals. Weeping and shouts of ecstasy, extended prayer, emotional worship, physical signs of the moving of the Spirit, weeping, shouting, joyful singing, dancing, leaping, rolling on the floor. Ever heard a holy roller? 
corpse and running. Some people fell into trances and saw visions. Other testi others testified to the gifts of the Holy Ghost. There were also common reports of people speaking in languages by the power of the Holy Ghost. Prominent leaders of the Second Great Awakening were Barton Stone, who was a Presbyterian and renounced predestination. He questioned the concept of the eternal sonship of God, the eternal Son of God, which means he questioned Trinitarianism, and he led believers to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. He lived from 1772 to 1844. Elias Smith baptized only in the name of Jesus Christ and rejected the Trinity. All this was going on in the 1800s. He lived till 1846. He started a newspaper, a religious newspaper called the Herald of Gospel Liberty. Alexander Campbell, the founder of what we call the Churches of Christ. There aren't that many in Minnesota, but they're really big in the South. Uh, they were called Campbellites for a while. He lived until 1866, and he, he emphasized that baptism is, in fact, for the remission of sins. Horace Bushnell denounced the idea of the Trinity and all Trinitarian theology. He died in 1876. Henry Ward Beecher strongly affirmed Jesus Christ's deity and said that Christ Jesus is his name. All that there is of God to me is bound up in that name. He lived until 1887. John Miller wrote a thought-provoking book called Is God a Trinity? Published in 1876. It rejects the Trinity, explains that the oneness of God is all in Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. Amen. So this was happening in different groups. They were not organized, but God was working with them. In the holiness movement, there were two very noted revivalists by the names of Charles Finney and Dwight Moody. Dwight Moody was a businessman, successful businessman. After he had his revelation of Jesus Christ, he left his business pursuits and founded a huge, what eventually would be a huge church, non-denominational church in uh, Chicago, but he was also an evangelist. He would travel. He was a pastor the whole time, but he traveled through the U.S. and Britain. Charles Finney was a Presbyterian that rejected predestination. He became a congregational pastor and served as the Oberlin College, which is an Ohio teacher and president. Uh, he preached on revival. He taught on revival. This was the birthing of the holiness movement. The National Holiness Association was inaugurated at a camp meeting in Vineland, New Jersey in 1867. They wanted to renew the Methodist holiness teachings. They believe that all throughout Protestantism, the Congregationalists, the Presbyterians, the, the Lutherans, all, all could come together if they would just teach holiness, sanctification, and living holy lives. But what happened was all those denominations rejected them out of hand, and so they formed new denominations. New denominations such as the Wesleyan Church, the Pilgrim Holiness Church. Anybody remember John Maxwell? He's Pilgrim Holiness. The Free Methodist Church. Uh, not necessarily holiness, but I was talking to James earlier, the Afri African Methodist Episcopal Church was formed during the Second Great Awakening by a group of people that left a Methodist church in Philadelphia because they were mistreated and made to sit separate because they were black. And so this was also, it started out as a holiness movement. The Free Methodist Church in 1860, the Church of God of Anderson, Indiana in 1880, the Church of God of Cleveland, Tennessee, in 1896, I noticed in the Bahamas that Pentecostalism was huge and the Church of God was the predominant faith. Uh, there's the Church of the Nazarene in 1895. The Fire Baptized Holiness Church. How about that for specific? 1895. The Pentecostal Holiness Church, which actually still exists today in 1900, and the Church of God in Christ, which its name implies that they were oneness believers if they don't necessarily all baptize in Jesus' name. The church name means God is in Christ, which is what the Bible says, to wit that God was in Christ. Um, the Christian Missionary Alliance was formed in 1887, that still exists, and another one um, was formed by William and Catherine Booth in 1878. Can you tell me the name of it? The Salvation Army. Thank you, Sister Thelma. <laughs> It was, it was also founded by A.B. Simpson. Um, sorry, the Christian Missionary Alliance, Missionary Alliance was formed by A.B. Simpson. So we're going to stop there tonight, but I'm going to say that 
the, I wanted to get to the holiness movement because it is of utmost importance because something happened on January 1st, 1901 that was birthed directly out of the holiness movement, that was birthed directly out of the Methodist movement, that was birthed directly out of the Protestant movement parallel with the Anabaptist and Baptist movements. And that thing is what we'll start with next week. But it is very important to know that God was dealing with people. Progressive revelation does not mean that God only gives one piece of truth in the 1500s and he expects people to wait till the 1600s. We can prove that because very quickly after Luther's revelation of justification by faith, the Anabaptists start saying, I want more, I want more, I want more. And then the Baptists said, I want more. And then the Methodists said, I want more. And then the Holiness Movement said, I want more. And then came the Pentecostals. Praise God. Thank you, Lord, that you deal with us. Thank you that you lead us and guide us into all truth. I want more, Lord Jesus. 